Hello everybody and welcome back along to Five Sisters Zoo. I hope you've been enjoying all of the lessons that we've put out across the last few weeks. We've looked at habitats and adaptations. We've looked at the rainforest. We've had a discussion about teeth, diets and food chains. And this week, it's time to turn our attention to something completely different. We are going to be looking at classification. Now that sounds like a, a bit of a kind of complicated word, classification. What does that mean? We tend to group animals, so we, we split them up into different groups. We, you know, some groups you'll be familiar with already and, and others you may not uh, be familiar with, but hopefully at the end of these videos you will be. So for example, we have groups like the birds, we have groups like the mammals, and in Thursday's lesson, we are going to focus on them a little bit more. Now behind me, we have our fantastic drawing of the, the Kingdom Animalia Tree of Life. So the animal kingdom is represented in this tree behind me here just now. So down here in this picture, we have sponges, which are an animal um, group, believe it or not, the sponges, the periphery. We have the nidarians, which are things like jellyfish. The tinophores, which are jellies that live in the deep seas and deep oceans as well. Then up here we have flatworms, platyhelminths. We have annelids, which are, and include the worms like earthworms that you guys might find in your own back gardens. Up here we have a group called the mollusks, which are things like snails, slugs, believe it or not, octopus and squid, they are also included in that group, the mollusks. And we're going to talk a little bit more about them later in this lesson. We have the nematodes, nematode worms. Then along here we have a group, a huge diverse group called the arthropods. That includes insects. It includes things like centipedes and millipedes. We also have crabs, so crustaceans, crabs, lobsters, and things like spiders and scorpions in there as well. Down here, you can see this picture of a starfish here. This is a group called the echinoderms, and that includes animals like the starfish. And then over here, grouped together, we have this big group, and scientists refer to it as the chordates. But the chordates include animals like fish, it includes amphibians, reptiles, birds, and mammals as well. And that includes me and you. So we belong up here with the rest of the chordates. So what we're going to do in today's lesson then, is we're going to have a bit of a discussion about how we group certain animals together. Why we classify them as birds or mammals or mollusks, for example. We're going to talk a little bit about that. And I'm going to introduce you guys to some new words. So the first couple of words that we're going to have a bit of a discussion about are vertebrate and invertebrate. Now, I'm sure these two words, many of you will have heard of them before. What we're going to do is we're going to be starting off by looking at some invertebrates, telling you a little bit more about them, and then later in today's lesson, over into Thursday's lesson, we're going to be focusing more on the vertebrates. Now, before we head out and start looking at some real-life examples, invertebrates are hugely diverse. There's many, many species of invertebrate animals out there, many more than, than vertebrates, that's for sure, and the invertebrates include all of these groups here on this animal tree of life. Yeah? And what we're going to do is we're going to head over to the Lost Kingdom, we're going to have a little bit of a, a look at an invertebrate species, and we're going to discuss why it's classified as an invertebrate, and what makes invertebrates so special and unique. So we've come across here to the Lost Kingdom to discuss invertebrates in some more depth. What makes an invertebrate an invertebrate? The simple answer to that question is that invertebrates are animals that don't have a backbone. So they don't have a backbone like you or I. So if you guys at home, if you kind of run a finger or your hands down the middle of your back, you'll feel your spine, your backbone. That is what makes us vertebrates. So animals that are vertebrates have a backbone. Animals that do not are what we call invertebrates. And there are loads of invertebrate species, far more invertebrate species on Earth 
than there are vertebrate species. And we are joined here by a perfect example of an invertebrate. So this is a little hissing cockroach, and these guys come from over in Madagascar. Now, you can see that if you look quite closely, this female that we've got here, she has six legs. So she's got three pairs of legs and she has two antenna at the front of her body as well. You can see these antenna, she's using them to kind of feel her way around. Now she is what we call an insect. So she's an invertebrate. And if we want to kind of um, break things down even further, she is an insect. So she belongs to that big group of animals, big group of invertebrates known as the arthropods. And within the arthropods, she belongs to that group known as the insects. And you guys will definitely be familiar with insects. I'm sure lots of you have seen insects out in your back gardens before or on woodland walks. Now, they're probably not all quite as big as this girl here. Now, hissing cockroaches can get a lot bigger than this. She is actually quite small. And one way that we can kind of identify an insect is if we look at their body, insects all have three body segments. They've got a head, something called a thorax, which is this kind of middle bit, and then an abdomen, which is this big bit at the back as well. And insects include um, things like beetles, flies, wasps. They are all insects just like this girl here. And here at Five Sisters, if anybody's ever been along here before, you'll see plenty of different insects on display, things like our leaf cutter ants, for example. And we do have several different cockroach species here too. Now, not all invertebrates are insects. We also have, um, you know, things like crustaceans, so things like crabs that will live in, uh, live more often than not at the sea. Um, so you guys might be familiar with looking for crabs at the ocean, um, but there are some crustaceans like wood lice that live on land as well. Um, and then we've also got things like centipedes, millipedes, and what we're going to do in a few minutes time is we're going to go and look at an example of an invertebrate that doesn't actually have any legs at all. Now, hissing cockroaches, as I've said, they come from over in Madagascar and they play a really important role in some of the forests over there. These guys are normally found living down on the ground and they're like little cleaners. These guys are what we call detritivores. A few weeks ago, um, we spoke a little bit about um, teeth, diet, food chains, and we spoke about herbivore, omnivore, carnivore. These guys belong to something like a different category altogether. They're what we call detritivores and they're going to eat all the kind of rotten stuff. Um, from off the forest floor. So they are super, super important. If we didn't have animals like cockroaches around, imagine all that waste that would just build up. So even although they're not the most popular animals, they're certainly very, very important. And remember, within a food chain or a food web, these guys also play a vital role because there are um, lots of larger animals, vertebrates and invertebrates, that would quite happily snack on something like this little cockroach that we've got here just now. So I'm gonna pop Let's go back in our tank just now. We're gonna head across to our education center again to have a little look at an example of an invertebrate that has no, no feet, no legs, um, like this girl does here. So to take a look at an invertebrate species that doesn't have any legs, we've come back across here to our education center. And I have with me one of our giant African land snails. Now, giant African land snails, all snails and slugs, in fact, they belong to a group of invertebrates known as the mollusks. And I've already briefly mentioned mollusks earlier on in this lesson today. Mollusks include snails and slugs. They are what we call gastropod mollusks. There's also bivalve mollusks, things like the mussels that might end up on some dinner plates across the country. And then we also have cephalopod mollusks as well. So that's things like squid and octopus, so that's a few examples of the different kinds of mollusks that, in, that exist in that one invertebrate group. Now, giant African land snails are absolutely fascinating. If you look at the top of this guy's body, you can see these big long stalks here. And right on top of those stalks are eyes. So these are eye stalks. And what they can do is they can actually, they can look forward, they can bend these eyes kind of behind their body to look behind them, and they can look to the side as well to make sure there's no predators, there's nothing dangerous nearby that's going to threaten them. If they did feel threatened at all, they would probably disappear inside this nice, thick, hard shell where they're going to have that added layer of protection. Now, you can also see this bit here, at the very front looks a bit like a moustache. That is their mouth, and inside that mouth is something called a radula. And that radula is a little bit like a cheese grater. Um, 
almost like a tongue covered in teeth. Imagine it like that. They will use that to kind of grate away at all the food that they're gonna eat. And normally, these guys are gonna eat, well, they'll eat fruits, they'll eat vegetation that's fallen to the ground, and occasionally they might even eat animal bones and things like that too. Here at Five Sisters, we give these guys cuttlefish in order to, they'll do that to, to obtain the calcium needed to keep this shell nice and thick, nice and strong. So it's important that we do give them those cuttlefish here in order for them to do that. But out in the wild, they're gonna be eating fruits, vegetables, plant material, and occasionally some of those animal bones too. Now, you can see this big kind of squishy, wet looking bit underneath. That is known as the foot. These guys will use that foot to drag themselves along the ground and possibly up into trees as well. And even although this individual that we have here is not fully grown, they're already a lot bigger than the snails that you guys will find out in your own gardens. Now, invertebrates across the world, there's, there's many different species that are currently threatened, unfortunately. And we can really do our bit to help protect uh, local populations of invertebrates, that includes insects, snails, slugs, worms, animals like worms, um, here in Scotland, you guys can all do your bit at home too. Why not build bug hotels? They are fantastic homes for many different invertebrate species. Instead of cutting all of the grass back in your gardens, leave some long grass where invertebrates can live. And creating dead wood piles as well is also very, very valuable. These guys will, you know, not these guys, but snails that we find in Scotland and other um, crustaceans, wood lice, things like that, will love to call dead wood piles home. So all of these things, while they might not be the most aesthetically pleasing, can be really useful for invertebrate species. And we all need to do our bit to make sure that we're helping to protect local populations of these incredible animals. So, we've spoken a lot about invertebrates now. What we're going to do is we're going to head up to start looking at some of our vertebrate species. We're going to go up to our fish pond and we're going to discuss vertebrates in a little bit more detail. So, to start talking about vertebrates, we've come up here to one of our fish ponds. Now, remember vertebrates, those are animals that have a spine, they have a backbone. They're not the same as the invertebrates that we've just had a little look at. The, the name is vertebrate, remember that. And that includes animals like fish, it includes mammals, it includes reptiles, amphibians and birds as well. And on Thursday, we're going to be having a very close look at amphibians, reptiles, birds and mammals. But today, I want to show you guys some of the unique features that fish possess. So fish are a group of vertebrates that are found living underwater. We find them living in fresh water, ponds, rivers, lakes, places like that. And we also find them living in saltwater habitats as well. So out in seas and oceans. Fish obviously living underwater, they don't breathe air in the same way that, that we do. They have gills. So if you look at this fake fish that we've brought along with us today, you can see these dark markings up at the head. These are gills and fish will use these gills to breathe. So that is one thing that fish will possess. Most fish are covered in scales. They have fins as well. And uh, a lot of them will also lay eggs too. So those are just some of the characteristics that fish will possess. So they are an amazing group of animals. They're not a group that you will see many of here at Five Sisters Zoo. We don't have many fish. Um, the reason we've come up to our pond here is because we do have some koi carp living in here at the moment, but they are quite difficult for you guys to see on this video. So hopefully you've had a good chance to have a little look at our fake fish here just now. Unfortunately, Fish and a lot of other aquatic species are facing a really hard time at the moment. They're facing a tough time. And a couple of weeks ago in our habitats and adaptations class, we asked you guys to design some plastic pollution posters. So educating people about plastic pollution and the problems that that will cause. And we had some fantastic examples sent over to us. If you've not already sent us your plastic pollution posters in, please do so. Fish are really negatively impacted by plastic pollution within lakes, within seas, within oceans. And there's a few things that you guys can do at home to try and, and help stop this from being such a, a wide scale problem. Now, obviously you can stop flushing things down the toilet, things like cotton buds and uh, you know microplastics that don't belong down there. Start recycling and reusing. So instead of going to the shop and getting a new plastic bag every time, take reusable bags. Those are just a few things um, that 
you can do to help solve the kind of plastic pollution crisis that is ongoing at the moment. And I definitely advise you guys to look into it because it is a huge topic, something that we can't cover completely in our video here today. But please do as much research into that as possible. We all need to do our bit um, because a lot of the aquatic wildlife, fish included, are really suffering at the moment. So remember as well, please send across your plastic pollution posters. We'd love to see more of them. It's an important topic and we need to make sure everybody is aware of it. So now that we've had a little chat about a vertebrate group, those fish, we're going to finish off our video for today, our lesson for today, over at our lion enclosure. I'm going to tell you guys a little bit about the lions that we have here at Five Sisters Zoo. They're our feel-good story this week because they are also, like the bears that we spoke about a few weeks ago, they are rescued. So I'm going to tell you a little bit about that rescue story before we finish off today. And then on Thursday, we're going to pick off, pick up uh, where we left off and we are going to discuss all about mammals, birds, reptiles and amphibians. Those four vertebrate groups that we've not had a chance to have a look at today. So we are going to be talking more about mammals, that group of vertebrates that our lions belong to on Thursday. But just to finish today's video off, we have come across here to our lion enclosure. And I'm going to tell you guys a little bit about the four lions that we have living in the enclosure here at Five Sisters Zoo. They're quite unique. The four lions that we have here, just like the bears that we've worked with since 2012, are all rescued. So they were rescued and taken to a Belgian rescue centre before being moved here to Five Sisters Zoo in 2015. So we have four male lions here, but they look a little bit unusual. The male lions that you guys will normally see in zoos or in wildlife documentaries, you'll probably be quite used to seeing them with manes, yeah? So that's something that you might recognize as a male lion, a lion with a mane. The four lions that we have in here, unfortunately, they do not have any manes. These guys were castrated um, by a circus that kept them before they were rescued, and that has meant they, they, they cannot grow a mane. Um, they also had part of the bone removed from their, their paws as well, which, has kind of left them looking a bit floppy when they move around. If any of you have ever been out to Five Sisters and seen this before, that is the reason why. Unfortunately, they were kept by, um, by a circus that didn't look after them very well. They weren't fed the correct food. Um, they, they weren't really treated well at all. And as a result, these guys did arrive to us here at Five Sisters in a fairly, a fairly poor condition. Obviously, they'd been in that Belgian rescue center. They'd done amazing work with them. Um, but when they arrived here, we knew this was gonna be um, their sort of end destination and uh, and we had a lot of work to do so our carnivore team has been fantastic they have had to um, make sure that the lions are now on a really good diet and um, so these guys are fed um, the best stuff possible for them and we're going to talk a bit more about that on Thursday we might even be able to see them uh, a little bit more up close um, shall we say on Thursday as well and um, hopefully so yeah, these guys are now doing really, really well and we are really, really proud um, that they are here, that they are safe and that they are healthy. Um, and hopefully the next time you guys get along to Five Sisters, you'll be able to see the four lions that we have here uh, in action. So we'll be back with part two of our classifications lesson on Thursday. So that's Thursday, the 4th of February. And in that lesson, we are going to be focusing on vertebrates. We've had a look at fish today, but on Thursday, we are going to be focusing in on mammals and their characteristics. We're going to be looking at birds. We are going to be looking at amphibians and reptiles as well. And hopefully, we'll introduce you to a couple more uh, words, ectothermic and endothermic. We're going to be speaking about the differences between ectothermic animals and those endothermic species too. So make sure you join us this Thursday. And thank you very much for watching today. Bye.